Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Patrick. Just a reminder, those of us just tuning in uh, that you're on Africa Media and you're watching Views on the Continent. And our focus today is to see and uh, analyze how African countries can uh, lift uh, from a shift from uh, uh, being a supplier of raw materials to a producer of semi-finish or finished goods of value. And we are looking at the possibility of those, the factors that will actually encourage Africa's total transformation and factors uh, that are impediment and how these uh, solutions or these uh, factors which uh, impediments can be uh, reversed and of course uh, see uh, that uh, uh, the stakeholders, uh, maybe the role of uh, uh, political leaders, uh, civil society, and of course the business uh, class uh, in Africa, and particularly the private sector that can actually engage in seeing uh, that uh, uh, stakeholders are intentional about uh, attaining this uh, perspective. Uh, we continue in the same perspective with you, Mr. Elijah Enrico. Earlier on, you highlighted the aspect of leadership, which of course uh, is uh, very important, you know, when the leadership is not actually meeting uh, the aspiration of the people and the leadership is not a visionary uh, we see of uh, how it is affecting even the growth of a country a growth of a continent and that's where uh, we are so now uh, I want us to analyze further into this uh, because we want to look at the the, the uh, hindrances or the obstacles of, of this uh, Africa's uh, maybe economic integration now let's look at the fragmented uh, nature of the African continent and uh, see if uh, this is a great, great hindrance to Africa's standing in one voice, especially at the international level. And if yes, what can be done? Now we are looking for solutions. What practicalities can come into place? Or, or maybe what is the, the uh, uh, modus operandi that uh, these stakeholders need to adopt today to reverse these economic trends and to see that indeed, in terms of international cooperation, there is uh, uh, actually uh, African countries and the other countries are at the same level of negotiations and uh, at presenting points which can go ahead to prosper both nations and not only seeing uh, that countries are engaging more in having raw materials taken from Africa to be transformed elsewhere. And we know the effect on that, especially on the employment of uh, young people across Africa. Mr. Elijah Inako. Is there something going on? Paris, can you hear me? I can hear you now, sir. You can write on. Okay, good, good. Mm -hmm. I was saying that, uh, you know, we are from Africa, you know. In Africa, we know that when you are going into a fight, when we we're kids, when we we're growing up, and somebody won't come and fight you, you always try in a way that you take the fight closer to your home because you know your brother is there, your sister is there, your uncle, your friends, then if you come tough, they are going to join you and fight the enemy. You fight on your turf. You fight where your strength is. Africa has a strength, and that strength is that God has blessed us with these natural resources. That's where our strength is. You fight based on what your strength is. You are going to a negotiation table. You already have the knife and the yarn. You have to dictate the terms of the arrangement. You talked about the influence of the West on manipulating Africa. But let me tell you something. Africa, it's, if your house is not divided, nobody is going to come to your house. If your husband and wife are not divided, no intruder is going to come in to destroy that family. The problem in Africa is that we have leaders that are being used by the West to destroy any unitary platform that Africa want to come up with. Let's take, for example, ECOWAS that is right now trying to double with Niger. 
when the economic community of West African states came out with a single currency, which they called ECO, they adopted a plan and they adopted strategy and they came out with the preamble and everybody signed into it. How did it fall apart? On the last minute, Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast stood against that plan and brought in what the so-called ECO, whatever it is, and tried to pack it into the euro. And that was a manipulation that was done by France, passing through Ivory Coast, to try that strategy. As we speak today, it's almost dead. Nobody's hearing about that plan of ECO as to have a single monetary policy. That is what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Africa does not have the leadership that can stand up to this. They have puppet leaders. If you look at it, another case, Clarish, look at the opportunity that, you know, you asked my colleague from the plan, how Africa, you know, take advantage of geopolitical maneuvering that's happening. Look at what's happening, an opportunity that's presented in South Africa. Mm -hmm. In terms of diversification of partnership, instead of actively engaging in some sort of South-South cooperation, what's happening? They are being tossed by the European Union. They are being tossed by you know, North American partners. They are being tossed here and there, and they are fragmented. French countries, some of them are trying to align themselves with France, while others are trying to align themselves with BRICS. Others are trying to align themselves with the United States and Canada. So there is this misalignment. African countries don't have an aligned policy and a platform in which they can work. Therefore, Western powers take opportunity about that fragmentation and they divide the policy. They use the policy of divide and rule. Because if you diversify your diplomatic and economic ties, what that does is that it avoids over dependence on a single partner and then it maximizes the negotiating power. That's what you do. You say, okay, I have this partner, I have this partner. If EU is not coming to the table in terms of my requirements and my needs and what I put on the platform, I can go with maybe some other South-South cooperation, maybe the BRICS, maybe India, maybe uh, China, maybe Brazil, maybe this one. But they are so fragmented in such a way that they do not have that complex. Not only that, I talk about your strength. You have to leverage on your strength. The strength of Africa, as we know it, nobody is going to deny that fact. Mm -hmm. It's our natural resources. In terms of Absolutely, technology, yeah. we are still coming there. But you have to strategize and say, this is my strength. You're not going to play the ball. You're not going to play the game on my turf because this is my turf. I have to dictate the terms of the argument. I have to dictate the destination of investment. I have to dictate the positioning and become a burgeoning market. Africans attract foreign direct investment. We do not need to necessarily go to the World Bank. We do not necessarily need to do the Britain World Institution. We do not need, we can negotiate bilateral agreement with a lot of countries without going through this draconian uh, policy that has been put in place by the World Bank and the uh, in, uh, financial uh, uh, Britain World Institutions and imposing terms on Africa that are giving them aids that come with strings attached. We do not need to go through that. You can negotiate with Patterns and say, okay, I'll give you an example. There's what we call an infrastructure development deal. The infrastructure development deal states that for any Western power that has come to Africa to extract gold, rubber, whatever it is, the terms agreement says that the economy of that region, it could be, let's take, for example, you're in Cameroon and you're producing, you know, gold, or whatever it is from Litura province or Southwest province, the economy of that region must be commensurate to the economy of the country or the municipality where this product is going to be semi-finished. Let's say this product is going to be finished in Brussels. You say the, the infrastructure agreement it says that the infrastructure in that zone where the product is being produced must be comparable. It doesn't say it must be exact. It must be comparable. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that you are not going to producing, for example, timber, and the roads in all that region are all dusty, dead path, and you're going to be, you know, finishing that product in Brussels, where you have all these gigantic roads and infrastructure and everything. No, the economy of those 
communities where this product is being exploited must be comparable, commensurate with the economy of the municipality where it is going to be finished. That is an infrastructure agreement. African president can take advantage of things like this and go into this kind of agreement. Cultural diplomacy. For some of you are in Kumba. I know I come from Kumba. That's where I come from. I grew up there. There was a mayor there that was called Mayor. Uh, 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 what was his name? Oh, I, he passed away. No, Kumbele, that was his name. He went to the Netherlands and had an infrastructure agreement with the community in the Netherlands. Can't remember which community is that. Yeah. And that is how Kumba was charged. Kumba was charged based on a bilateral municipal agreement between a community in the Netherlands and the Kumba Regional Council. That was the first time I grew up in that place. And that was the first time I saw Kumba being tired, having grown up there. That was the first time. But again, African leaders are not taking advantage of this. Recently, we just talked about the climate uh, argument that Africa was trying to negotiate. Look at the mess that happened there. What did the African countries get from that climate leadership conference? What did they get from it? There was a discussion and an agreement that they were going to, this number of loans were to be involved uh, dispersed to the African continent. Which country can, has actually stood and said, we got this from the climate agreement that, you know, was agreed upon that African countries are not polluters, therefore they need to be compensated for that. Which country in Africa can stand and say, this is what we got from that agreement, this is what we are implemented, these are the resources, this is the uh, development that's coming. No, you don't see that. That's what I'm saying. African countries do not have strategic diplomacy, like my colleague already mentioned. You only find them hovering around in yeah, African UK summit, Africa Russia summit, Africa China summit, Africa. Before we know it, we will start having Africa India summit. It is a colossal disgrace for the African continent to be having this without any strategic arrangement for the development of the continent, given the fact that we hold the night and the year. There is source all over the world. Whether you're talking about gold, you're talking about silver, you're talking about plutonium, you're talking about uranium. You can name them, and I will tell you where Africa stands in terms of those resources. So again, we need the right leadership in order to compete in the rest of the world, because we already have the knife and the yard. In data, it's about an intentional leadership. It's about a leadership that is visionary and a of course, uh, very determined to take Africa to the top. You, you know, uh, uh, there's the Africa's Agenda 2030, uh, Africa's Agenda 